I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by John Storrs Hall, known to his friends as Josh, a subject matter expert and key influencer in the field of molecular nanotechnology. Josh is the author of NanoFuture, What's Next for Nanotechnology, a fellow of the Molecular Engineering Research Institute and a research fellow of the Institute for Molecular Manufacturing. His achievements also include former roles as a computer systems architect at Rutgers University, the founder of the Sci Nanotech Usenet News Group, founding chief scientist of NanoRex, and a former president of the Foresight Institute. He joins us today to discuss the visionary idea for nanotech utility fog that he first proposed back in 1993 as a swarm composed of self reconfiguring modular nano robots. So Josh, welcome, sir. I have been a tremendous fan of your work for two decades now. So it's a genuine pleasure to be able to finally interview you. Uh, let me begin with your background and achievements. I've always viewed you as a visionary and community leader in nanotech, but I'm wondering how would you describe yourself? Well, actually, if, if you wanna take my uh, career up until I got into nanotech in, in a some single simple phrase, it was I designed supercomputers for the Pentagon. But then I got into nanotech and I started doing a bunch of different things. Um, and after being at the Foresight and being at NanoRacks and, and all that sort of stuff, I um, basically retired from active technological work, which I was getting a little old for anyway, and started writing books. And so right now I call myself a futurist and author. Ah, okay, okay. Well, and, and again, in today's interview, I'm, I'm focused so closely on utility fog. And so, you know, in, in the future, it might be good to come back and talk about some of those other experiences and expertise, because I know that you have this incredible diversity of knowledge and experience. But, you know, again, I just, I'm so excited about utility fog. That was well, my focus. Yeah. Over, over the past uh, roughly 10 years, I've, I've been working in uh, uh, a particular field of futurism where I wrote a book called Where Is My Flying Car? Um, and so I, I actually bought an airplane and learned to fly it and was, was investigating the question of why did everybody think we were gonna have flying cars and why don't we have them now? Um, but if we had something like utility fog, we wouldn't even need them. Yeah. We could, we could just sort of take off. <laughs> um, well, so so let's let's get into the concept of utility fog then, and and let's start with the the fog itself first, and we can touch on the constituent foglets after that. But I, I wanted to kind of start at a high level because I think a lot of people aren't familiar with this, and this is definitely like a big picture idea, right? That that a lot of people may have trouble grokking. So, at, at a high level, would it be accurate to call utility fog a swarm of nanobots? And then it's composed of basically this, this swarm, each has a tiny onboard computer and a set of nano arms that link or release to change physical properties. Would, would, would that be a fairly accurate description? Uh, more or less. I, the word swarm for robots has gotten picked up by people who are actually working in the field and, and they try to uh, make and program uh, a uh, number of robots that will cooperate in, in a task. Um, and the main difference between that and utility fog is that in the original utility fog vision, there are literally trillions of robots. Whereas in the people who are doing swarm robotics at, at universities now are talking at most thousands and probably hundreds. So it's a it's a, a difference in scale that makes a difference in kind. Ah, okay. Well, and, and that is important to point out. These are these are tiny, right? Like the speck yes. of dust, tiny. Um, right. it, so there's, there's a a, um, uh, a point of of nomenclature when I uh, when I came up with the idea. I had the notion that you would have these all around you and you would think of yourself as being in a cloud of them. And so I used the word fog to express that notion that, that here you are and you're surrounded by the, the little robots and so forth. But I probably should use snow instead. 
because snow is actually a lot more like what it would really be like. You have these um, uh, little particles, but the particles stretch out and they touch each other and they can take on different forms and um, can be sort of packed into any shape you want and so forth. And, uh, and, and what I call the, the utility fog would in fact, um, in physical reality be a lot more like snow. Uh, okay, so, so and, and again, I, I'm trying to restate some of the, the principles that you've written about for folks who aren't familiar with this, but uh, could we describe this as kind of a universal simulator? In your original article, you'd mentioned being able to simulate, for instance, a car, a television set, furniture, even the floor plan of your house. So if I understand right, not only could this simulate the shape of nearly anything, it can also do the color and it can do textures as well, right? Well, textures in particular, um, you have to enhance it a little bit to do colors. And in fact, uh, over the over the years, I've, I've come to think that it probably would be uh, best to have uh, special purpose, what I call iPhones, <laughs> that they're like earphones, but for your eyes, where the, it, it just holds this thing up in front of your eyes and you get a, uh, uh, a virtual reality sort of experience through that, uh, rather than have the foglets try and do that um, themselves. But that's more or less beside the point. Uh, the fact is that and, and another reason for calling it snow is that if you had a, a lump of the utility fog that was simulating an object, but not filling all the space, it would look like snow because the, the size of the individual robots and the stuff they were made out of would cause them to refract light just the same way snow does. And the object that it was forming would actually just look uh, pearly white. Mm. Okay. Okay. And, and so again, to, to, to drill back down this, this simulator idea, I think one of your original visions for this was a way to replace seat belts, where you could fill a vehicle with this, and you could move around and you wouldn't really notice it. But then if an accident occurred, it would, it would form basically a lattice by linking these arms, and, and it would become a protective solid. So, so that would be one application. But in like in in a more household again going back to the furniture analogy in a more household way um i think you'd also mentioned having this stuff uh, you described it as having it hide out near the ceiling or on the walls and if you decided that you wanted a couch it would basically flow down from the wall and form a couch and that would be generally indistinguishable from the real thing right yes yes um it turns out that a lot of what we think of as being the, the surface and texture properties of a solid object have a lot to do with the kind of vibrations you get into your fingertips when you move them across the, uh, the object. Um, so you, you rub your hand across sandpaper and you get different frequencies than if you rub it across a mirror uh, or a piece of wood or, or whatever. And so you can make it feel like you're touching a piece of glass or a piece of wood or a piece of sandpaper or sand itself simply by when the substrate detects that motion it actively generates the frequencies your fingertips would expect to feel as that was happening and, and you can try this for yourself you can take a uh, um, an old-fashioned uh, phonograph needle um, connected to a speaker put one hand on the speaker and use the other hand to run the needle across, say a piece of sandpaper or a table or something. And it will feel like the sandpaper or the table or the wood in the hand that's touching the speaker. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Well, and so right now, and again, I'm, I'm just looking at this from the high level, in the make community, one of the really big trends right now is 3D printing, right? And and I, I think people are really enthralled with this idea of, I don't have to go to the store. I don't have to necessarily use online purchases. I can take my 3D printer and I can use generic materials to make something and have it, right? And, and I think that's empowering in various ways, right? Like maybe the store sold out, you know, who knows? For, for whatever reason, 
you can do it yourself, you can make it yourself, and these can be complex things. So in the case of utility fog, this is a similar idea, but on this incredibly grand scale of I can make whatever I want for my house pretty pretty much, and, and I can do that nearly instantaneously. And when I don't want it, I can basically dissolve that back into this fog, more or less. Yeah, I mean, actually, there's a, there's a fairly simple way of describing the similarity here. Having a 3D printer is like having a plotter with paper in it. It can draw any picture you want with its pen and so forth. And some plotters have colors and uh, some are big and so forth. Um, having utility fog is like having a video screen. The picture appears all over instantaneously and it can change from second to second. Uh, whereas with the 3D printer, you have to sit there and actually build the thing and, and you get a, a, a static physical object, which is a, a brand new object. And it's a lot faster than, you know, sending away to Amazon for it. Uh, well, in some cases it is. But uh, the uh, but with the with the utility fog, um, the things that you're building would actually change from second to second if you want it. And so much that the hard part of it would not be so much the the production of the of the physical effects or the apparent objects or any of that. We would be designing it. Um, because you would need a lot more design uh, to get through a day than you do now. Ah, okay. So let me let me drill down now a little bit into foglets. I, I think that people probably are getting a sense of the the power and the flexibility that this idea has. So it's composed again. These are these are uh, I believe you said these are. Uh, let me see. Each of these foglets is has twelve arms measures about 100 microns across, and contains a tiny computer capable of processing simple instructions, controlling the arms, and coordinating position. So can you tell me a little bit more about your vision for each of these dust spec-sized foglets? Yeah, actually, the, um, the reason I, I designed them at, at, at that scale was because that's about the size of a human cell. Um, but you can make them smaller, or you can make them larger. And in fact, I think in my writings, I talked about industrial fog where the, where the fog list would be a thousand times more volume, i.e. 10 times as far across. Um, and you would be designing that in order to use it for uh, heavier duty applications. Um, I think once it actually turned into a thing and, and people were using it for all sorts of stuff in the world, you'd have a, a whole range of stuff like that. So you'd have very, very fine ones um, for applications where you wanted to be extremely precise and uh, control things at, at an extremely fine scale. And then if you're just throwing big stuff around, you know, they might even be big enough to see. Um, uh, like or, um, I mean, so uh, you, can, you can see grains of salt, you can see uh, individual rocks and gravel, but uh, you can make, get, depending on, on the scale you're working with, you can make, uh, um, uh, more or less arbitrary shapes in, in each one of those media. Uh, and so I think in, in, the, in the real world of fog, you would actually have um, a mixture of shapes and sizes and in fact of uh, uh, other capabilities like the uh, light emitting antennae and, and, and so forth as well. But the, you know, the original design was just my best guess at uh, design that would do about as much as I could figure it, um, uh, you know, for for a single design, and 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 went with that when I started trying to describe it because it was a lot simpler that way. Yeah, yeah, uh, and, and and I think the original one was, it, it, and again, there's a lot of you got very technical, and so I'm trying to kind of restate that. Well, I think you said the body itself would be something like ten microns. And then again, there, there are 12 arms coming out in a dodecahedral fashion. Each one has like a little hand or pincher on it. Hand sounds, I think, a, a little bit less frightening, you know, for, for nanotech. Um, and, and so then the entire volume of this thing was about 100 microns, which you just said is about the size of a cell. But um, it, it does make sense. You could make them smaller. You could make them larger. Uh, it, and then 
each of these also has an antenna. So I, I was going to ask um, how the foglets are powered. Is the antenna how they receive power? It sounds like this is this is some kind of a wireless power was your vision for these things. No, actually, um, it was intended that the, uh, once you linked up with another foglet, the, you'd just have electric circuits and, and it would run mm -hmm. through the fog rather than uh, you'd be using the, uh, remember the, the, the fog as a conglomerate substance is going to look like snow. It's going to be white and light isn't going to go through it very well. It's going to be highly diffusive. Um, and even though e any single foglet would be uh, invisible, it would, uh, because of its size and it's made of a transparent material. But the, the thing is that if you get enough of them, uh, you get enough scattering of the of the light that you get the effect of of a, a bunch of snow and and so trying to power them by radiation probably wouldn't work. Um, oh, okay. So you, you, but a radiation that whose wavelength was close enough to the size of the foglets, which would be the the one that you would be most able to receive efficiently would by that very nature uh, be the one that scattered too much. Um, so, so you're more or less stuck with uh, uh, powering them by uh, just electricity through the links. I, I see what you mean. But since they do have 12 arms, it's easy for them to basically mm -hmm. receive through one. Oh and, yeah, and... They're, all, they're always touching something. And, and the 12 arms actually, I mean, you can imagine a whole bunch of different possible designs for that. That 12 arms, were because one of the best structures you can build that consist of arms um, is uh, the octet truss of, of Buckminster Fuller, um, which is similar to the shape of the uh, adjacent atoms or molecules in a uh, face-centered cubic uh, crystal. And that's a very stable shape and it's able to um, exert forces more or less equally in all directions. So uh, you would have an, uh, an isotropic uh, material property if you did it that way. Whereas if you only had arms sticking out, say, um, in uh, four directions or you know, forming cubes or something like that, it would, it would be hard to compress along the lines of the uh, the uprights of the cube, but easy to push sideways. And so uh, if you want something that will simulate uh, any material in any direction, you want something more like 12. Ah, uh, okay, okay, that, that makes sense. So, so I guess another thing that I should ask is, again, each of these arms has a hand at the end. Can the arms do complex manipulations themselves or are they limited to basically just grabbing and releasing those hands with other foglets? Well, they do two things. Um, they grab and release the arms of the other foglets and the, uh, the grippers that I designed were specific to come to another gripper on the other end of the, the other foglet's arm, latch together like that and form a stiff um, structure. And then they, they could unlatch and, and go their own way. But the main thing that goes on along that arm is that it is telescoping. It can stretch and contract along its length. And it turns out that if you're simulating a solid, that's all you need. They don't even have to latch and unlatch. They, they, you've, you get into the right shape by latching and then all the morphing of the, of the substance is simply done by changing the length of the various arms. Now, if you're simulating a fluid where the thing has to actually flow across um, the uh, uh, where the fluid would have uh, sort of laminar flow, what you do is you would take the analysis of the laminar flow that the fluid is, is doing to change its shape. And um, where the layers are, where the layers are moving with respect to each other, um, they do sort of a square dance thing. They, they, they grab one guy and they swing around and they grab the next guy and so forth. They kind of walk across each other. Um, but uh, all of the, the idea of making the foglet so small is that no individual foglet actually does anything 
it's all done en masse in ensembles and collectively. So uh, the, the frog bits are way too small to actually do any significant task by themselves. They all have to be pushing to get a push or pulling to get a pull or um, moving across each other to get a, a shearing motion. Um, and so you're essentially not ever gonna have a single foglet uh, accomplishing any described task. Ah, okay, okay. Well, and so I think, uh, again, this takes us back to this idea of a universal simulator because by releasing some of these arms, that they're able to simulate the properties of various substances. So you, that could be from liquid to polymer to metal, basically, right? I mean, you, you can have not just solids, not just this fog, but really anything in between. You mentioned laminar flows and fluids. So you could really do pretty much anything. It's a universal simulator, right? Yes, it is. Um, and as I said, what you do at the, at the interface between the the simulator and the human being is, is you can start faking it. You can you can start um, generating synthetic uh, stimuli, uh, either light or uh, sound or pressure or any of this other stuff that um, the human body of the uh, user or recipient would actually pick up, and that goes nowhere near the physical limits. So um, you can have this, you can have this stuff, the fog, um, simulator, a lot of stuff that you would feel, but wasn't real because your, your senses don't actually go all the way down to the ground. And that's why you can get away with using something like fog to simulate almost anything that the, the human body could sense about as closely as you'd be able to sense it if it were real. Ah, okay. So on a nanoscale, and I'm, I'm going to use a cheesy movie comparison in a second here. On a nanoscale, these foglets are, are going to look like a lattice of tiny particles, like specks of dust or like snow, as you mentioned. On a human scale, what, when I tried to visualize this, I was like, okay, what is something that people are going to be familiar with? And, and the closest thing that came to mind was the liquid metal man from Terminator in Terminator 2. W would that be kind of a fair representation of how these might look and behave? Well, it would look more like uh, a snowman. I mean, imagine instead of being made of metal, he was made of snow. And, but was actually able to do all the sort of things he did, you know, turn... Uh, flow from shape to shape and, and, and do all this sort of stuff. Um, the fog as a, as a solid would be able to be at least as strong as a, a good hard engineering plastic. Um, strong as at least a, a high-end uh, furniture grade wood uh, in, in terms of its structural strength um, and able to generate uh, pressure is well past what you're able to, to withstand as a, as a human being. So, um, and it was, I mean, that's the way I designed it specifically to match the capabilities and, and sensibilities of, of a human uh, who is having the world simulated for him. I mean, you could change the designs and, and get either, you know, bigger or smaller uh, capabilities out of the, out of the, the substance. But there's a, uh, there's a general thing that it's worth knowing about how technology works. Um, and my best example for it is, uh, you know, the quadcopter drones that are now so common and, uh, and so useful. And the thing is that a uh, quadcopter drone in, in its simplest form only has four moving parts. I mean, the, the, the shafts of the uh, engines and the, and the propellers and so forth are, are one physical thing, although they, they're, uh, you know, made of different pieces and, and, and put together. But, but the fact is, as a, as a machine, it only has these four moving parts. And that is a huge optimum in a design space. And so the, the reason I designed the foglets the way I did was because they, at least as far as I can understand these things, are also a, an optimum in a design space. They can do one thing. They can push or pull along each arm, uh, and then they could uh, grab or let go. But the... Um, all of the stuff you want out of uh, a material, uh, an intelligent morphing material, can be done simply by uh, expanding or contracting the, the material and 
uh, controlling that at a, at a scale that ranges from seconds to uh, milliseconds. I mean, mm-hmm. you, you, can, you, can, you can get bigger, you can get smaller, you can change shape, you can generate sound um, all within this, this range of possibilities. And that's about uh, what you need to interact with the human world um, and be sort of the, uh, if you want a, a science fiction uh, reference, the holodeck on, on uh, Star Trek, the, the next generation one. Um, that's the sort of thing you could expect out of utility fog with one exception, which is that you put the, the utility fog in a place where um, there's real work to be done and it can do the work. It's not just a hologram. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and again, this is this is a big picture idea, and I think that's one of the reasons that I just absolutely fell in love with it. So, uh, again, uh, on this, uh, this this is the scope of this. Um, you know, it, the reason I mentioned I mentioned the Terminator Two. You said it'd be more like a snowman. It, the reason I mentioned that was you can also, and I believe you wrote about this, something called fog people, and by by combining foglets with virtual reality you can basically create kind of a virtual telepresence system that, that might allow a person to essentially teleport themselves anywhere, even though their original body remains in place, right? So, so that, again, another movie comparison almost might be like the Matrix, but in the real world. Yeah, actually, there's, there's sort of two levels to that. One is where um, you use the capabilities of the fog to put the physical things you were going to do somewhere else because you're being simulated by the fog, but then where you are, the environment that the, um, the simulated you is experiencing, that environment gets simulated by the fog to you. So you have these two things going on at once and it's a, it's a, uh, a virtual transposition or uh, telepresence or, or whatever you want to call it. Okay, that's, that's number one. Number two is, you don't have a physical existence at all. You're uploaded into the fog and your brain is being simulated by all the computers in a certain a, a batch of, of foglets. Um, and that is your only existence. And if that's the case, you can really go from point A to point B simply by transmitting all the information necessary to do that simulation. Mm, that's a good point. Now, each one of these computers, as I understand things, and again, this was back in the 90s, but I think you estimated that they could process something like 100 million instructions per second or something. Um, you know, well, basically, with nanotechnology, you can build uh, computers that would make ours look kind of sick, kind of the ways ours made the ones in the 1960s look kind of sick. Um, so you, without any reference to fog or anything else, you can just expect that to happen. Um, and given that we now have computers that are, that are easily capable of doing as much computation as the, as the human brain does, once we get it kind of completely figured out what that is, um, simulating uh, a person that, that is essentially just as real um, as, a, as one that runs on wetware um, is, is going to be par for the course. Um, the question is, would you really want to bother uh, trying to run this thing as a distributed program on the onboard controllers of a whole pile of foglets, which would very likely be possible, but it would be a lot more uh, efficient to have a, uh, a dedicated simulator for the, for the brain and have the fog sort of carry it around to where it's needed or um, have its information uh, just transmitted to one, you know, a few feet, a few miles, uh, a few parsecs along, uh, depending on, you know, what kind of scope you're operating in. So, yeah, you could, you could have something that uh, would run your brain as a, as a dedicated piece of nanotech computational hardware. And it would probably be about the size of a pea. Wow. wow. So the, the fog could easily carry it around if it needed to. Yeah. I, I, again, the, the possibilities are so tremendous with this. You know, I, th- this is one of those. I, I, I think this, this should be a prerequisite for anyone who's interested in engineering. You know, it's just the possibilities are so vast, I guess. 
So the, the, well, that, that is a bottom line that you can repeat and repeat and repeat. Um, I mean, I, I had one glimpse of one possibility, but the bottom line, the possibilities are so vast, you can just shout that from the rooftops. Yeah. Well, so you had this idea originally, this is around 30 years old now, and it's it's based on the principles from Drexler's nanosystems book. I'm wondering, have, have advances in technology changed this concept at all, or, or perhaps helped you envision new possibilities that weren't feasible in the 90s? Not really. And, and there's a, there's a, a very sorry uh, tragedy to the, to the story is that basically, uh, as far as the possibilities of nanotechnology go, Drexler is still as good as he ever was. Um, the people in the meantime have been trying to do the sort of things he described without the tools that they really should have. And so uh, progress towards a, a robust uh, adult level nanotechnology uh, capability is uh, ha has not caught up with what it should have done by now. And there's a whole bunch of reasons for it. And if you want to read my latest book, I, I talk about them quite a bit. But, but the bottom line is that um, Drexler's vision for the, the capabilities of a, of a mature nanotechnology are still just about the best description of what that is um, that we have and the, the people have mostly just been playing catch up to it and, had, and uh, in very few cases have they exceeded it. Ah, okay. Now, I, I do want to touch on worries about gray goo. Is, is this a concern or is it not an issue since the foglets are externally powered? Um, well, for uh, utility fog, they're, they're uh, completely uh, irrelevant because a utility fog is not a self-reproducing system. Um, it would have you basically have to have uh, if you had a lot of utility fog and you're using it a lot, you'd have to have utility fog factories. Now, the fact is, they could be a cubic inch, um, and you know they would, but they would have to have uh, channels where raw materials would be brought to them and then they would let loose the foglets that would go out and participate in the in the overall cloud but um fog by itself um it would be like uh the the notion that you know your your car is going to escape and and uh go live off of trees and so gasoline in the woods and start uh mating with other cars and will be all overrun by cars well the fact is if you don't understand how cars work you might worry about that but I don't. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, uh, right. No, that that makes that makes complete sense. Well, and I, I think what you're saying is then this is not self-replicating, and so you would have nano factories for this, and you would probably need them because you'd have foglets that would just get lost or damaged along the way. I mean, just having oh that yeah, that volume. would happen. That would happen constantly. So so for any um, uh, situation where you were using fog seriously, um, you would have to have the factories running more or less all the time just to replace the, the, as your body does. I mean, you, you, you lose cells all the time and, uh, um, and your body is always creating new ones. Ah, uh, okay. Well, Josh, I should ask, what do you think the timeline potentially might be? Because I know nanotech, you know, it, it's one of those things, what, what do they say about fusion? It's, it's been 20 years away for the last 50 years. Nanotech seems like it's in a similar position, I guess. Well, fusion fusion is coming along. It, it's it was thirty years away, fifty years ago, and now it's only twenty years away. Um, so, so who knows where we'll get it? But but we are we are getting noticeably closer if you if you look at the details. Um, I think nanotechnology is is more of a case of something that we know how to do. We just haven't done it. Uh, fusion, on the other hand, is something we don't know how to do, and and we've been groping towards it. But if we wanted to uh, make a full court press, take the best ideas that we have and, and, and just put as many bright people on the project as, as you could find, uh, we'd have it in 10 years. Um, the big question is, do we want to, in the sense of you know, society uh, investing in that? Um, I think it's going to be like artificial intelligence. Um, if you remember, artificial intelligence was kind of like fusion in the in the sense that 
over the past 50 years, it was always 30 years away. Um, and the, uh, it went along and went along and, and, and people were saying, oh, progress is so slow, nothing's really happening. All these people have been promising us, uh, you know, artificially intelligent robots and all this sort of stuff all this time. And as a futurist, I actually took the time to look at the history of that and compare the predictions with what actually happened. And what did happen was that in just the past decade, AI hit a watershed and all of a sudden, boom. And what did happen was that people started investing a lot of money into it and it started working and there was an exponential takeoff in capabilities. Uh, a lot of that had to do with the amount of money going into it because people started looking at it and saying, oh, wow, this is good. It really works. Therefore, I'll invest in it. And there's a, a major feedback effect, which is where you get exponential uh, growth curves in the real world anyhow. So uh, AI has over the past five, maybe seven years, been going through that kind of, of runaway feedback uh, phenomenon. And uh, and it's because the investors and, and pundits and whatnot in the, in the world as a whole suddenly realized it was working. And so the, uh, I think the same thing is going to happen with nanotechnology. And I think it could happen in the next 10 years. Uh, it's very likely to happen in the next 20 years. Um, but I can't be anywhere near that. Uh, precise because I don't know what the people who are looking at it are thinking. Yeah, absolutely. Josh, thank you again for your time. It is it is truly an honor to have been able to interview you. Let, let me close by asking, what are your future plans? Are you still working on nanotech? Or uh, you mentioned the flying cars. Have you moved on completely to other areas? Well, actually, I, I have, a, as a futurist, I have a vision for what our technology could look like if we should decide to uh, take advantage of all our possibilities. And I call it the second atomic age. And it's a pun because back in the day, we talked about the atomic age and atomic power and all that sort of stuff. If you start working with nanotechnology, what you're actually doing is actually atomic. Okay. But I think that nanotechnology is going to enable nuclear power to a much greater extent than, than we can do it now. And there's a lots of reasons for that. And um, rather than going into them in, in any great detail, I'll just point you at, at, uh, at my book. But uh, the bottom line is that we are at the threshold of uh, an ability to use the energy inherent in nuclear processes uh, much better and uh, more uh, usefully than we are now. And so you take the, uh, the product of these two technologies plus artificial intelligence, and you get a capability that is, that is just like having an entire another uh, industrial revolution. Mm, Suppose, okay. for example, that you are, you're Elon Musk and you want to go and live on Mars and breathe the air. Okay, right now you can't do that because um, the air is 200 times uh, less dense than Earth air is in the first place. And, and there's 200 times less oxygen as a percentage of that air. So you're looking at 40,000 times too, too little oxygen. On the other hand, it's almost all carbon dioxide. So if you had nanotechnology, you could build a machine that would crack those CO2 molecules and give you O2 and just stick the C on some little diamond it was growing somewhere. Um, and, uh, but then of course, in order to make that, that machinery work, um, you'd have to supply as much energy as you would have gotten from burning that much carbon. And so you can't get it from chemical fuels um, or else you would just have to be carrying the oxygen with you in the first place, uh, in which case you might as well just breathe it. So. Um, so if you want if you want to breathe the Martian air, you have to have not only the nanotechnology to, to to crack the CO2, you have to have a power source that you can carry around with you in your backpack or whatever. And so you need both legs of that second atomic age technology that that I 
seem to see. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's that's the future of humanity because you know either we get off of Earth or another dinosaur killer asteroid comes along, um, and and that that'll be the the end of that. Um, so we need at, at the very least to 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 spread out and settle the, the solar system where we're a lot more immune to a single point accidents. Um, and and also it'll it'll be a lot of fun and very interesting and and, and it's what I think the, the human race ought to be doing. But uh, second atomic age technology with with nanotech and and nuclear power sources is uh, how it ought to work. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, Josh, thank you again for your time, sir. It has truly been an honor. Well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm uh, my head is swelling as we speak. Yeah. <laughs>